I am glad to be back with you this morning. Um, we had an amazing trip to Colombia. Every part of it was fantastic. The food was great. Uh, I loved it. I ate way too much. You guys ever had chicharron? Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, the scenery was beautiful. They have beautiful mountains in Medellin. Uh, we went into the country one day and saw some just beautiful scenery there. We went to a what's called a football match. We call it soccer. That was a quite the cultural experience being there. Um, experiencing a different culture, drinking their coffee, all of those things were just fantastic. Preaching was a tremendous gift, being able to preach at their church on Sunday morning and preach at the camp and being able to minister to some of those students. But one of the things that was um, that was just so beautiful to me was the partnerships. It was a partnership. This trip, if you didn't know, was set up from our church and Sun City Church in El Paso. Two churches in the States that partner with each other decided to partner with a church in Medellin, Colombia. So it was a three church partnership there where we did this youth camp and did some other ministry and, and served each other and the, just the fellowship and love of these three churches from totally different places. We have the beach. They have the desert, and Medellin has just the beautiful place with the mountains and everything. And we all came together to serve the Lord together, and it was just a beautiful thing to see all these people kind of mesh together and love each other because of our common faith in Christ. Nobody but me, nobody but the pastors knew each other, and Caesar knew some people a little bit, but um, but all of our teams, all of our people just mesh together with such fellowship and friendship that will continue on. Uh, for time, for, for a long time. So it was just a, a beautiful thing to see this partnership flourish and grow. And I expect with every future trip for this partnership to get stronger and stronger to the glory of God. Now, our text this morning is, uh, going to focus on the very beginning stages of the founding of the church in Philippi. This is the beginning of a great partnership between Paul and the Philippian church. The book of Philippians, which was written sometime later, is the warmest of all of Paul's letters. He had a special fondness for this church. He was very grateful for their partnership in the gospel. And it all began in chapter 16 of the book of Acts. And I'm sure that when Paul set out on this venture to Philippi, he didn't expect that the partnership would be as great as it was. But it was. Tremendous. And Paul himself said later in this letter to Philippi that no other church in Macedonia partnered with him, partnered with him in giving and receiving except for the church in Philippi. It was a unique church. It was a special church. And the partnership with Paul and the church in Philippi is a great example for us as we partner with the churches that we partner with, because we want to partner well. Our strategy is not to partner with as many churches as we can, but to be very selective in who we partner with so that we can do it very well. So my heart is full this morning. We're going to cover a lot of ground as we talk about Philippi this morning. And there are four scenes in the remaining verses of chapter 16 that we're going to walk through this morning. First, we see the conversion of Lydia. Second, Paul and Silas are imprisoned. And then third, the Philippian jailer is saved. And fourth, Paul confronts the magistrates. All right, let's read the text. Beginning in verse 11. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed that there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. 
And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. When her owners, But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they had heard uh, that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you for your kindness and grace. We thank you for the glorious gospel, which is our only hope. Father, I pray as we walk through this text that you will make the gospel clear. Father, I pray that by your grace, if there's anyone here who's not believed upon your name, that today you might open their heart and give them the faith to believe. Father, bless the preaching of your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So first we see Lydia's conversion. Paul and his companions traveled from Troas to Philippi, and Luke tells us they remained there some days. And at this point, Luke starts using the plural pronoun we. Pronouns actually do matter. Um, it seems... You agree, right? Yeah. Okay. So it seems Luke is including himself in this mission trip. Luke has joined the team. So now it's Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And evidently there was no synagogue in Philippi, uh, but Paul heard that there was a place of prayer down by the river uh, outside of the gates, and there were women there going there to pray. So instead of going to a synagogue like he normally did, he went down to this place of prayer in order to proclaim the gospel. And out of all of those women, one stands out above them all, this lady named Lydia. 
She was from the city of Thyatira, which was known for um, uh, its purple dyes. And Luke tells us she was a seller of purple goods. Now, that's not just haphazard information that he's using as filler in, in the book that he is writing. This is very important information because Luke is wanting to tell us that she was a wealthy woman. She was a woman who, who had a lot of means. Purple was used often among the royal class, so she would have sold to those who were higher up, and she would have made a lot of money. Um, Luke also tells us that she was a worshiper of God. She was very much like Cornelius. Um, she was not converted at this point. She was not Jewish, but she was a Gentile god fear who looked to the one true God of Israel as the only God. So the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was being said by Paul, and then she believed upon Christ. Now listen, this is what happens every time, every single time a person believes upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord opens their heart. It is not the eloquence of the gospel proclamation that opens the heart. It is not great stories, illustrations, or jokes, or specific applications that opens hearts. It is not the ability of the preacher to put the cookies on the bottom shelf, as they say, that opens hearts. It is not age-appropriate teaching or presentation or anything like that. It's not the charisma of the person or the cultural situation. It is the Lord. The Lord supernaturally breaks open hearts that are dark and hardened, and He overcomes our stubborn wills and causes us to be born again. He does the work of conversion so that we can grab hold of the truth of the gospel. So if we are born again, if you are born again this morning, believe me and understand that it is only by the gift of God's grace that you are so. Lydia heard the gospel from Paul, and she believed and was baptized along with her household. We see the same thing happen with the households of Cornelius and the Philippian jailer. Their whole households were saved. Um, I was very clear in verse 32 when we get to the Philippian jailer that the, the word of the Lord was spoken to everyone in the house. So as a good Baptist, we believe that the gospel was proclaimed and those people believed upon Christ and the believers were then baptized and added to the number of the church. Now Lydia right away bore the marks of conversion. She was giving herself to the one another's before she even understood what the one another's were. Out of her gratitude for hearing the gospel and receiving Christ, she wanted to show hospitality to Paul and his companion. And it seems that she would not take no for an answer. Luke says she prevailed upon us. You know, when someone's trying to bless you and you're trying to say no, just take the blessing, right? She prevailed upon them. And they go to her house. Now, at the very end of chapter 16, after Paul and Silas are released from jail, they go directly to Lydia's house. And Luke tells us that there they saw the brothers, that is the brothers and sisters, that is the church, and they encouraged them before departing. So it seems that Lydia's house became the meeting place for the church at Philippi. God knows how to care for his church. God knows how to supply his church with everything that she needs. And through this lady, Lydia, he provided resources and a place to meet. Lydia was a successful businesswoman who had accumulated some wealth and was willing to leverage that wealth for the glory of God. Without generous people like Lydia, uh, it would be much more difficult to fulfill the Great Commission. It would be much more difficult for churches to move forward and missionaries to move forward. Partnerships in the gospel will be greatly hindered without people like Lydia. Lydia held her wealth and her home with open hands before the Lord. Listen, even if you don't have a business selling purple goods, even if you aren't super wealthy and don't have a tremendous house, you still need to hold what you have with open hands before the Lord. So that everything that you have is used for His glory and His glory alone. You don't own it anyway, right? Now, the second scene that we're going to look at, Paul and Silas are in prison. 
As Paul and his fellow companions were walking to the place of prayer, a woman followed them. This was a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, and she was a fortune teller. And this gave great financial gain to the the people who owned her. And she followed Paul around saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. This demonic spirit that was inside of her knew exactly what Paul was doing and who Paul represented. You know, James chapter 2 verse 19 tells us that even the demons believe and they shudder. So the demon-possessed girl says what is actually true. She knows what's going on because of the demon inside of her. These men are servants of the Most High God. He is the Most High God, and He is the only God, the one true God. And His servants do proclaim the one way of salvation. There is no other way. Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The gospel is not one way among many ways. It is the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way. The demon-possessed girl kept annoying Paul. I'm glad to see Paul get a little bit annoyed. But Paul got a little bit annoyed hearing the same thing over and over again, and finally he turns to her and casts out the demon, and it came out of her that very hour. And we're not told what happens to her, uh, but her owners are very upset at Paul because their lucrative business is now bankrupt. They were so upset that they dragged Paul and Silas, the others drop off, and Paul and Silas are dragged into the marketplace to be judged by the magistrate. Now, we see a huge contrast between Lydia and these slave owners. Lydia had considerable wealth, and she held it with open hands before the Lord. She was sacrificial and generous, committed to the things of God. But these owners were full of greed. They're, they, they, they held their wealth with, with clenched fists, clinging to what they had and what they had earned. And their consciences were not bothered by keeping a slave or making money through demonic means. They were so obsessed with money that they failed to see that the gospel being proclaimed by Paul and Silas was the greatest treasure in the universe far more valuable than whatever they had earned through this girl and this business that they were doing. Whatever wealth they had gained, it was nothing compared to the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. They were not at all interested in the glory of God and the advance of the gospel. They cared only about their own glory and their own little kingdom. This is why Jesus said, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? So these greedy men accused Paul and Silas of disrupting the city, and the magistrates, along with the crowd, stripped off Paul and Silas' garments and beat them with rod. And when they had inflicted them with many blows, they went and threw them into jail. And they charged the jailer to keep them safely, so he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. So the jailer took extra measures, to keep them secure in prison because he knew that if they were to escape, it might actually cost him his life. So the third scene, we see the salvation of the Philippian jailer. Now, let's imagine Paul and Silas' situation. They had just been inflicted with many blows, beaten with rod, flogged with rod. They surely had exposed flesh. Their skin was broken. They, they were bleeding, um, bruised, beaten, stripes on their back, skin flailing off, possibly. In verse 33, we are told that their wounds needed washing. They're literally in chains. Their feet are fastened in stocks. And the pain they felt was very real. It wasn't like the Holy Spirit gave them some pain medicine or anything like that. They felt it just like you and I would feel if we had exposed wounds on our back. And they're put into a very dark, uh, nasty dungeon. This is where they're kept. 
And we see the apostles heal many other people, but they never healed themselves. They felt every bit of it. They suffered for Christ. They were truly suffering, just as if it were to happen to you and I. The pain was very real. And yet Luke tells us they were praying and singing hymns to God. They were filled with joy. Listen, we all go through some hard stuff. I've gone through some hard stuff. You've gone through some hard stuff. If these brothers can have the joy of the Lord in this situation, then we probably can handle whatever we get. Christians are supposed to be the most joyful people on the planet. And how can we not be joyful? When we are thinking rightly, how can we not be joyful? We have been reconciled to our holy creator. We were once his enemy. We were once controlled by sin. And we've been set free. And we've been reconciled to our holy God. Our sin has been cast out. Our sin has been dealt with at the cross. If you're in Christ, your sin, your sin has no more sway on you. It, it's been dealt with. It's, it, there's no more condemnation for you. The wrath of God has been satisfied. He's removed it, cast it as far as the east is from the west. And all you know is grace and His forgiveness. How can we not be joyful? We have been given eternal life. The Holy Spirit resides within us. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit our comforter. We've been given everything that we need for life and godliness. The joy of Christians is a tremendous apologetic for the truth of the gospel. And I think this is what happens in the prison, in the jail. Paul and Silas could have sat there and wept. They could have groaned with pain. And we wouldn't say a word about it. We'd say, yeah, I sympathize with you. They could have encouraged each other. Like, hey, we got to press on. I know this is really hard. we got to press on. Come on, I'm praying for you. They could have acted like that. They could have at least you know, been justified to acknowledge the, the terribleness of their situation they found themselves in. But instead, Luke tells us that they were so overflowing with joy that they were praying out loud and singing hymns to God out loud. They knew that what Jesus said was true when he said, Blessed are you when you are persecuted for my name's sake. The other prisoners were listening, probably with sheer astonishment, because this doesn't make sense. Something supernatural, something dramatic is happening here for these men to be so filled with joy in light of their situation. And then all of a sudden, there's a big earthquake, so severe that all the doors were open and the shackles fell off of everyone. And the jailer wakes up and he realizes that all the doors were open and he decided to pull out his sword and kill himself. Now that gives you an idea of how terrible the Roman justice system would have been. Because whatever the Romans would have done to him was not as bad as him taking out his sword and falling on his own, so own sword, killing himself. So he had given up. He was going to take the easy way out and kill himself. But Paul calls out to him and says, don't harm yourself, we're all here. Nobody had escaped. So he rushed into Paul's cell with trembling and fear and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? There is no more important question a person can ask. And Paul and Silas' response is very simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Listen, we are saved by faith alone and Christ alone, by the grace of God alone, as revealed in the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. Now, we noted earlier that James says, even the demons believe, and they shudder. The demon and the slave girl believe that Jesus is Lord. The demon knew the fact that Jesus is Lord, but the demons have not bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. To believe and be saved does not mean mental assent to some theological facts about the gospel. To believe that Jesus is Lord means to bow the knee to him as Lord. It means to see that He alone is Lord. There is no other. And all so-called other gods should not be worshipped. The faith that saves is a faith that recognizes that Jesus is Lord. It doesn't make sense to say, I believe that Jesus is Lord, and then live my life as if He is not. 
There's a problem there. There's a disconnect. This Philippian jailer bowed the knee, placed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and saw him who, as who, who he really is, the king of kings. Now, surely Paul explained more. Surely Paul gave more of the gospel uh, and, and explained more of what Jesus accomplished. Jesus took the sins of his people upon himself on Calvary's cross and paid the penalty for our sins. And he adds his righteousness to the account of everyone who believes. So positionally before God, we have the righteousness of Christ and our sins are washed away forever in totality. Now in practice, we fight, don't we? We scrape and we claw. Now we have everything that we need for life and godliness. And we should expect to be growing and maturing in Christ. But we fight. We fight in dwelling sin, and we fight to submit every area of our lives to the Lordship of Christ. Sin, the sin even that resides within you, believer, the indwelling sin, the remnants of sin that's still within you, it wants you to act more like the slave owners. It wants you to clench everything that you have in your life so tightly that it can only be used for yourself and your glory and yourself in your own little kingdom. Using people and money and whatever else for your own glory and your own kingdom. But when we let go, more like Lydia, when we yield to the Spirit's work in our life, we're placing ourselves low before the King of kings and Lord of lords. We become more like her. And we give all that we have, whether it's a lot or a little, however the Lord chooses to use us and lead us to put it on our heart and all those things, we use everything that we are and everything that we have for the glory of God. And we can suffer, and we can sing praises to God like Paul and Silas because he is worthy of our worship. So Paul and Silas preached the gospel to the people of the Philippian jailer's house, and they believed, were baptized. And there was also, just like Lydia, some immediate change in the jailer. He, he practiced hospitality right away. He, he washed the wounds of the missionary, and he set food before them, and he rejoiced with his whole house that he had believed. In God. Now the fourth and final scene that we'll look at this morning, verses 35 through 40, Paul confronts the magistrate. In verse 35, the next morning they sent word to let Paul and Silas go free. Now we don't know why they had a change of heart or why they decided to let them go. Maybe they were afraid of the earthquake. Maybe they had heard a report of what happened and they were like, whoa, something's going on here. We need to let them go. We don't know. But the jailer went and set them free and uh, uh, to, went to set them free and said they could go in peace, but Paul said no. Now that's a little bit shocking, isn't it? There's not many incarcerated people who would resist their freedom. Right? Paul says in verse 37, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and they have thrown us into prison. And now they want to they want to throw us out secretly. No, let them come and take us out themselves. Let 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 them come and walk us out. So it was a huge violation of law for Roman citizens to be treated like this. Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. Um, the magistrates could be removed from their office for such an offense, or maybe even worse. I don't know. But a Roman citizen had the right to a fair trial, and this was more like mob justice that was happening in the streets. Now, the irony of this situation is that Paul and Silas were innocent of everything, and yet they were treated as lawbreakers. And the magistrates who so mindlessly beat them and arrested them are now seen as truly the lawbreakers. So the magistrates, when they found out the reality of the situation, they were very afraid, and they came and apologized to Paul and Silas, but they also asked them to leave the city and they escorted them out. Now, what are we to learn from this story? Why does Paul insist on his rights as a Roman citizen? Well, the point, I don't think, is that in every situation we should like ardently demand our rights as citizens in whatever country we live in. I don't think the point is that we need to brashly oppose anyone who treats us unfairly. I think we should expect to be treated unfairly. Peter tells us not to be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you. Paul did what he did to the magistrates 
so that they would have to acknowledge that they were wrong and Paul and Silas were innocent. It was important for the rapidly growing church to have a good reputation and not to be seen as lawbreakers. So Paul's insistence on the magistrates coming to release them personally and walk them out as a, as a demonstration of Paul and Silas's innocence, that was actually missional. He was doing that missionally for the glory of Christ and the advance of the Great Commission. Because by him doing that, it proved that he was not wrong in what he did. He didn't do anything wrong. They were innocent and the magistrates were wrong. They're not lawbreakers. They're not disrupting the city. He wanted it to be public so everyone knew the truth. He was protecting the church, Philippi. Now listen, Christians can't always be on the good side of the government. The book of Acts and many centuries of church history have proven that the world opposes Christ and opposes Christianity and as a result opposes Christians. should not be surprised by that. We can grieve when we see the kind of things we saw in the Olympics. We can grieve because we know it grieves the heart of God. And I also grieve what those people are going to face on the day of judgment. But we shouldn't be all that surprised. It's like I'm surprised, but really I'm not surprised. The, 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 the allure of kindness is being pulled away from the world. And the world is being revealed for what it is. And look, it's not going to get easier for Christians. It's not going to get easier for us. And we should not expect it to. But for what Paul and Silas did in this particular situation, the law was on their side, and it was a good thing that Paul had the wisdom to do what he did. Otherwise, it could have led to unnecessary persecution of the church. And after their release, they go back to Lydia's house where all the church is gathered, and they encourage all the brothers and sisters before departing. This is the beginning of the church in Philippi, the beginning of a great gospel partnership that Paul enjoyed so very much. The letter to the church of Philippi was written approximately 10 years later. Uh, it's unique among all Paul's letters because of its warmness. His relationship was different. He loved them uh, just differently than the other churches, and it produced much joy in him. In that letter, he uses uh, a form of the word joy 16 times in that letter, in that short letter. He speaks about unity and humility and contentment. He is grateful that the Philippians have shown concern for him and provided a gift for him while he was in prison. And he was even more happy to the credit it added to their account. He was happy that they were faithful and they were generous. It's a beautiful partnership. Healthy partnerships with other churches are a tremendous source of joy. And it's such a privilege to be able to work towards the fulfillment of the Great Commission with like-minded brothers and sisters. The Lord is pleased when we look outside of ourselves, both individually and corporately. Um, the church could have stayed in Jerusalem. They could have endured the persecution and stayed there and never left. The church in Antioch could have kept their missionaries and not sent them out. The church of Philippi could have kept their resources and not sent them out. But they were all focused on the mission of God. They were willing to have open hands with both their people and their resources for the sake of Christ and His kingdom. And I think it's a great example for us as we think missionally and as we think about our partnerships that are such a joy. By the way, as a side note, uh, Brant Small, who is the pastor of Sun City Church in El Paso, will be here in Jupiter, and he'll be preaching for us on August 18th. And Heido is our uh, the pastor of the church in Columbia that we partner with, and he will be here on August 25th preaching for us. So be here for those. Get to know these brothers. Love on them. Listen to them. Proclaim the word. And you'll understand why we're partnering with them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and kindness. We thank you for the, these beautiful narratives that we have. Uh, as we see you advancing the gospel across the world. We thank you for Paul and his faithfulness. 
We thank you for our, our partner. We thank you for Sun City Church in El Paso. Pray that you bless them immensely. We thank you for um, Radil Del Sur in Colombia. Father, we pray that you bless that church. Bless Haido as he pastors the church. Father, help us to be good partners. And help us to be kingdom-minded, to think outside of ourselves. Help us to be open-handed with our lives, with everything that we are, for your glory and honor. Father, we love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.